At this time, we're going to have some of Red's friends come and speak on his behalf today and share some of their stories and history with Red. Um, I'm going to ask them to go ahead and make their way, if they would, to this front pew, so you'll just be ready to um, take each other's place up here. So Hank Fister will be first, and then Bob Reed, Tom Stewart, and then Michael Moore. So let's just uh, take some time today as we hear some great stories about Red's life. I want to start out by reading a scripture that will be familiar to almost everyone here. I want you to think about it, about each part of the scripture, and how it pertained to Red in his life, his demeanor, and how he treated people. The scripture is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, in the beginning of verse 8. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is, it is, self, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. Love is patient, love is kind. You know when you're around someone who exudes these virtues. Those, those of us who had the privilege of knowing Red felt he was genuinely, genuinely one of the nicest, kindest, loving men we've ever known. Being around Red was, in a word, comforting. I've never met anyone who, after spending any time with Red, didn't come away thinking he was one of the nicest guys they'd ever met. I had the pleasure of Red's company at many tennis tournaments I played in, and he went to an event with me three years in a row in Atlanta called the AT&T Classic. The event began with a pro-am scramble golf tournament for players and sponsors Monday morning, the first day of the tournament. Red had the distinction of winning that tournament all three years. The first two years, the winners received AT&T cell phones. In 1990, cell phones weren't as small and convenient as they are now, but they were still pretty cool. We were sitting at a large round table at the lunch awards ceremony after the golf with about six or eight guys when it came time for the awards to begin. That's when Red said aloud at the table, man, I hope I don't get another one of those AT&T AT cell phones again this year. At that moment, the golf pro asked the president of AT&T to come up and pass out the awards and the guy next to Red stands up. And he walks up to the front. I looked at Red, and he looked at me with those big, wide open eyes, and he just dropped his head. Well, he did get another cell phone. And after the awards were done, I saw Red up front chatting with the AT&T president. A few minutes later, I was visiting with some of the other players, and through the windows that went out onto the golf course, I saw Red and the AT&T president driving off in a golf cart towards the tennis venue. Later I walked to the tennis venue to find Red as the tennis matches were about to begin and there was, there was a good one that was about ready to start and it would have been fun for Red and I to watch it together. I looked for him everywhere but I couldn't find him. So I finally went out to watch the match myself thinking Red was going to miss out big time. Then by chance, as I was sitting there, I looked across the stadium court at the AT&T presidential suite, and there was Red with the president having a good old time while I was sitting in the bleachers by myself. That was Red. He was so kind, he could make you feel like a lifelong friend in five minutes or less, even if he did, didn't start out with his best foot forward. Love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Many of you here today will feel like you knew Red pretty well. We'll hear things about him that you had no idea he accomplished uh, or experienced in his life. I learned a couple more this morning, just, just a little bit ago. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be on Red for a while, he would eventually let you into his life and, uh, and times, and would, but he would never boast or brag about what he had done or who he had met in his life. I met Red in the mid-1980s when he painted a couple of cars for me. After spending several weeks in and out of the shop, I found out that he had gotten into the business by building and rebuilding cars and sweeping floors in the Hollywood studios. I asked him if he'd ever gotten to work on some famous cars, and he finally took me into his office and opened up a photo album 
of the ones he'd worked on and the cars that he had done for famous actors and celebrities. You're going to hear more about that from Bob. But I had to drag that information out of him. But that was read, humble, never boastful. Love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It, it is not easily, easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. The first year Red traveled me to New York, to New York at the Open, I introduced him to several of the top players of the day, Sampras, Lindell, Andre Agassi, to name a few, and got them to sign shirts for Red that, and hats that he'd bought there at the Open. He took them all back to our hotel room that night and neatly placed them up on a shelf high in the closet. And after returning from the courts, next day he noticed they were all gone. He just collapsed back on the bed and sat there realizing they had been stolen. After sitting there for a minute, he finally said, I sure hope whoever took them needed the money and used it for some good. That was read, not easily angered, and kept no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. As far as love always trusts part, in this verse, I'll never forget the first trip Red went with me. It was to New York, and Red was a bit nervous about the trip because he hadn't flown much. I just told him, trust and stick with me. I told him I'd travel all over the world for the last 12 years, flying 150,000 miles or more, and I knew what I was doing. Well, we got to LAX plenty early, had about 90 minutes before the flight. We grabbed some food at a restaurant and went to the gate to wait, and at the restaurant and gate, Red began to tell me stories of his youth in Oklahoma and how he made it out west and started working in studios in LA and working on cars. I was spellbound to say the least. After about an hour or so of the stories at the gate, Red finally said, what do we do now? And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean, what do we do now? He said, I think the plane might have left. I looked around where a couple hundred people had been waiting for the jumbo to take us to New York and the seats were all empty. I'd been so spellbound by his stories, I never even noticed them all lining up right in front of us and walking onto the, through the gate and onto the plane. Red said, I saw them all getting on the plane and I saw the gate close, but you said trust me, so I figured you had some up your sleeve that I didn't know about. <laughs> that was Red, trusting no matter what. We rebooked and caught a red eye out later that night. Love always protects, always hopes. When Red found out about his diagnosis, all he spoke about was his family and how to protect and prepare them for the likely eventuality of his death and to make sure they were taken care of when he was gone. He never once complained about his situation or worried about his situation, but he worried for others. He was diagnosed on his birthday four and a half years ago, and I never even sh he never even shared that with me. I didn't know that. Garrett told me that just recently. See, Red wouldn't have mentioned or talked about what kind of bad luck that might suggest. That was Red facing the truth, trying to protect his family and friends. As far as love is persevering, Red persevered through cancer treatments for four and a half long years with chemo treatments every other week. Originally, doctors told him he had four to six months to live, but he survived the longest by far of any other the doctors had ever heard of that type of cancer. There were times when I wondered why Red persevered for so long, but in that time, Red had a chance, with the help of others like Pastor Robin, to understand the role that the Lord Jesus Christ played in his life, and Red was baptized in August as a public confirmation of that faith. God's timing is not our timing, but God's love never fails us. Red's love never failed us. It's my prayer that I might demonstrate in my life some of those loving virtues Red did throughout his. God bless Red Harden. Yeah, this is sort of like getting a root canal. Um, loss is a terrible thing. All of us will lose as we go on. This community, this state, this country lost an icon in motors, motorsports. Uh, Red Harden was, well, like I said, an icon. I, um, I deal with loss, we all have our ways. And my way of dealing with loss is to think about the good things, the fun things, the important things that uh, Red and I did. And like Hank said, stories abound. And <laughs> 
there's not enough time in this day or, or tomorrow or any other time really to talk about all the stories. But I'd like to tell you my favorite story. Uh, there's a reference in the, in the brochure to, um, to Howard Hughes, and I'd like to let you know kind of how all that transpired. But first, you have to understand, and many of you do, some don't, that Red was known nationally for his expertise in customizing and building cars. His, his talent was so great that Ford Motor Company asked him to participate in the custom car caravan. This is where they take these huge trucks, fill them full of custom cars, all with Ford engines or transmissions, which makes sense. And they go all over the country, not only the country, but also Europe and Asia. And that's kind of the backstory. So Red is at this show put on by Ford in Las Vegas many years ago. And he's standing there, and this guy starts walking around the car, looking at the car that uh, Red brought to the show. And Red was polite, blah, blah, blah. And the guy left. And pretty soon, one of the Ford execs walked up to Red and said, um, you know who that was? Red said, no. Well, that was Howard Hughes. And there's going to be a limousine waiting for you at 5 o'clock when the show is over, and he wants to talk to you. Sure enough, 5 o'clock, limousine. They go north from Las Vegas about an hour to, I guess you could call it a mansion. I'm not really sure. I've never seen it before, that's for sure. And Howard Hughes meets the limousine. Um, they walk inside, and Howard Hughes says, make yourself comfortable. Here's a, an area where I keep some of my artwork. Red loved art, as I think many of you know. And so he's walking along and looking at this art and, I mean, expensive, expensive artwork hanging on the walls. So he comes to a frame, and there is a red push-up bra framed. And about this time, Howard Hughes walks out and says, that, I'm paraphrasing, what I made off of that paid for all the artwork in here and more. And he actually invented, this is a trivia part, he actually invented the push-up bra for one of the movies that he was working on way back in the day. I don't, I don't really remember which one it was. And they begin a relationship there. And this relationship continued on until really Howard Hughes died. Howard Hughes wanted him to make a car, and Red did. And uh, Howard Hughes would call, Red would say, Howard Hughes would call two or three or four o'clock in the morning, and they'd talk for hours on the phone. He would come into Red shop with a paper sack full of money, put it on the desk, and they would talk. He wanted to see the car, what the progress was, blah, blah, blah. And this went on for a while, and at one point, Red says, Mr. Hughes, you know, you've really paid for this car already. And Red told me that Mr. Hughes said to him, I'll decide when I've paid enough for this car. That's my choice. Well, one day, Red walks into the shop, and there's all these black suits standing around, and the sheriff. And the black suit says, we are going to take anything and everything that had Mr. Hughes's name on it, anything and everything, including the car. And Red said, you can't do that. And the sheriff came up and said, look, you can fight this. If you do, I'm going to take you to jail. They're going to do what they're going to do, so why don't you sit down and relax and don't worry about it. And they did. And the car's gone. When all the stuff with Red came up and the, the story was told and everything, I tried to find any evidence of that car anywhere. I called Hughes Corporations in Las Vegas. They pleaded. They didn't know anything about this thing. Nothing at all. So where that car is, who knows. But... Uh, one thing I know about that car, it's in my mind. Um, thank, you for your, um, thank you for your attention, and uh, God bless Mr. Harden. Good morning. My name is uh, Tom Stewart, and uh, it's been my pleasure to have been a friend and to have uh, known Red Harden since about 1978, when we began, began playing tennis at Laurel Glen Tennis Club. Uh, we formed many friendships over those years, uh, centered primarily around tennis. And it was not uncommon uh, to be on a court after work three or four nights a week, and weekends as well. And at that point in my life, I was kind of wondering, what, do, what are people like that don't have tennis in their life? Because it was such a big part of ours. Red had many traits that caused people to want to be his friend. He could do anything 
mechanical, and had been mentored by some of the best in the car restoration, car building business. He was quick to share that talent with so many of us he considered as friends. Red had a wonderful sense of humor and a true humility, as it's been pointed out already. He lived to show, uh, he liked to show his love for people by doing things for them. He had a unique way about himself and many expressions that were pretty unique. If he liked something, he might describe it as peachy. And he would be laughing when he said that, and it was contagious. Red was a big kid at an early age. He, and he became a protector of kids as he was traveling the world on his own. I remember a story he told me that at one time he was traveling with his younger brother. His brother was about five. And Red was sure to watch out for him as well as others at that point. Red was a Golden Gloves boxer. And you would not want to engage with him in any confrontation. But Red was also always a gentleman and would go way out of his way to help anyone he thought needed help. Red was a great storyteller, and he had many stories to tell. One I remember is him running into a businessman on the streets of New York. I think Red might have been hungry, and I think he might have asked that gentleman for a buck or two for some food. He looked at Red, he said, uh, son, you wait right here in the sidewalk, I'm gonna go up to my office and I'll be back. He came back down to the sidewalk and he gave Red the gift of a shoe shine box. And he said, son, you will no never go hungry if you learn how to use this gift. There were many people that came into Red's life that protected and fed Red when he needed it, and what Red was grateful and very generous to those who needed a hand over the rest of his life. Red loved playing Santa Claus at Laurel Glen and did that for several years. If there was a kid in need, Red would be there. He and Alicia had an open door policy and allowed kids, I'll say young men, going through a rough time to come into their home take up on the couch, and enjoy some meals, whatever they needed. Many of those young men are now uh, sitting with us today, and uh, that would make Red proud. Red was a standout athlete, both in tennis and golf. His backhand tennis shot was something to enjoy, especially when you were his partner. He shared stories of his golf achieve achievements while traveling with Hank Fister to New York for the US Open. Red was comfortable with all kinds of people, including the accomplished businessman executives that he met on some of those trips. Red enjoyed supporting uh, our Kiwanis project of taking kids shopping for years, and more than a few kids benefited from his generosity in that regard. Yes, work was a priority, but we did carve out some time we traveled to Hawaii. We enjoyed fishing in Mexico. I'm, I know Garrett shared with me that the other night that the time that he was able to spend with Red on that trip, just he and Red in a, in a boat was very special because there were hours where they had time alone. So uh, I think it's fair to say that Red over, overcame a tough start and became the man, the husband, and the father that he so longed to be. Red was happiest when at home with Alicia and Garrett and his family, and also while at work, where he had built not only a world-class complex, beautiful buildings uh, for his business, but he had built a team of professionals that he was so very proud of. So he fought hard over the last four years to spend uh, more time with his family and we are all comforted by the fact that Red was recently baptized and shared with Alicia that he is now a Christian, just as she is. And those were his words, not mine. We will all miss our friend, and he will always be part of our hearts. Thank you for these few moments and the opportunity to share some thoughts. Good morning. 
My name's Michael Moore. How interesting it is to discover some different things about Red, this person that you thought you knew so well from the other speakers. So we've heard one thing uh, from each of the three and from myself as well about Red's humility. We've heard about his love and we've heard uh, from every person about Red's commitment, love, and caring for his family. Um, the Howard Hughes story is amazing. More than one of us have heard that before. Uh, one of the things that stuck out to me about the Howard Hughes story is that Red didn't recognize him. Uh, even then, Howard Hughes was a family name to most of us. Red's not that impressed with people. We heard that he's a protector. We heard about his tennis playing. Anybody that knew him knew that he was a gentleman, so thank you for emphasizing that. We heard that he was a storyteller, so let me start there. I met Red through Alicia. Uh, Alicia is part of a group uh, that have known each other since high school. We call the peeps, short for our people. People you're comfortable with, people you can call when you have pain, people you can call and say, let's have a beer. People you can say, hey, we're putting together a barbecue in about five minutes, you wanna come over. So I met Red, uh, I think at the first business on 19th Street. But I didn't really meet Red. I met Alicia and Red was working. So I saw Red repeatedly through the years Hi, hi, and he was always friendly, he was always pleasant, but he's busy working. Alicia ran the inside, Red ran the shop. And over these first few years, I, Alicia just spoke so highly of Red, what a special man he was, and all these things he had accomplished, and you need to get to know him, and well, you, Red never talked about that stuff. Unless you asked him, he would ask you what you were doing and never mention a word about all these phenomenal experiences he had in his life. Um, I learned about Red's prowess on the tennis court. He had a racket, uh, a bag of rackets, under one of the desks there at the shop, I believe on California. And I said, is that Red's? And Alicia said, well, yeah, I told you he's a tennis player. She said, in fact, he'd probably like to play in one of the insurance agent's tennis tournaments. He does a lot with you guys. And I said, Red, Red, you wanna play in the tennis tournament? Yeah. Well, how good are you? Well, I think I'm a strong B player, or whatever he said. Well, he came to our tennis tournament and walked away with the winner's trophy. So I learned that Mr. Humble was a phenomenal tennis player and, and just didn't say anything about it. I think he and his partner, didn't, wasn't his partner a gal that played at Cal State then? A, a gal? She came to, he brought her along, and I think they both walked away with, with uh, trophies. One of the things that stands out from all of us here, the speakers and everybody else, is the love that Red had for Alicia and Garrett. Uh, and, and again, it was shown more publicly, and by publicly, I mean at least he would talk about it once he was ill. I want to work, make sure mom is taken care of. I want to make sure everything's all right. I want to make sure everything's set up. I don't want to leave this. I don't want to leave that. Um, he was so humble that it took an awful long time for me personally to get past the very outside of the layers of who Red was. Um, and I remember, I remember specifically the night that it happened. We were at uh, Stephen Darla's house for a backyard barbecue, and somehow the seats were pretty much taken, and Red and I ended up together on one of these long ice chests full of beer. So we're sitting there, every time somebody came for beer, you'd get up and say, they'd leave and sit back down, and, and at some point I said, well, so how'd you get in the car business? And then I shut up for once in my life. Over the course of the next couple hours, as we got up and down and, and uh, drank a couple beers together and, and participated in his backyard barbecue, I got to hear some amazing stories and a summary of an amazing life. Some of what I'll share didn't come from, from that night, and, and I'll uh, ask forgiveness in advance if all the details aren't right. There might have been some alcohol in almost every one of the times I heard a story from Red on my part. I heard about the, uh, the beginnings in Oklahoma at the orphanage. It's, just, it's almost shocking to most of us that, that a young boy kept running away from the orphanage, and I said, well, how'd you finally get away? He said, I figured out I wasn't running far enough. 
He said, so I went to New York, and that was the end of that. He made his way over the next uh, short time, as, as others have shared, from New York uh, out to California. And the way I remember the story of how he found his first job sweeping at the body shop, he said he was walking down the street and he heard a commotion going on and somebody was, loud voices and somebody was getting fired from a body shop. So he waited a while for this uh, cantankerous sounding owner to calm down a little bit, went back to the body shop and said, uh, heard you earlier in the day fire that man, uh, probably need some help. And the guy said something along the lines that you're probably not even qualified to sweep my floor. And Red said, well, if you show me how, I'll do it. And he said, Michael, that man had a particular way of sweeping a floor. You couldn't just get the floor clean. You had to do it exactly like he wanted done. He said, I paid attention. I swept that floor exactly like that man told me. And he said, at the end of the first day, he said, you can come back tomorrow. He said, so over a period of weeks or months, I watched carefully everything he did. He said, all I did was sweep and clean and do what I was told. And one day, he had a car in there that he was going to chop. And he said, Red, come over here. Take this piece of chalk and, and show me what you do with that car. He said, I, I, I got down on the car and I outlined how we would cut the pillars and how we would shape the the." the roof and how we would put the window in the back. And he said, so I, I literally just drew it on the car. And he said, he looked at me and said, you told me you'd never worked at a body shop before. That's not true. Nobody can do that that's never done it before. And he said, no, sir. I just watch you every day. And I figured that's how you'd do it. What a gift. Gift of paying attention, gift of humility, and truly had an artistic talent. It Doing what he did with cars is not mechanical. It, there's plenty of mechanics, but it, it's mechanical. Uh, the rich and famous, I, my memory is the first car was a Lincoln that he did for a movie star. Amazing. Just what an amazing life. Um, that night, I heard about famous TV cars. I heard about partnerships with custom car builders. Heard about partnerships with auto companies, traveling the nation on a tour with the professional tennis players, friendships with people like Arthur Ashe. I heard about Red and his partner, and this car, I'm not a car guy, this car, I had to ask him at least 25 times over the next years, what'd you call that car? GT40. Okay, well, so tell me about how in the world do you end up in Le Mans with Henry Ford II and Carroll Shelby building one of the most iconic cars that went on to win Le Mans, what, four times straight? Absolutely amazing. Carroll Shelby, Rick Mears, Buck Owens, Jay Leno, Howard Hughes, it just goes on and on. And when Red shared, again, you pretty much had to ask him to share. When he shared, there was never a hint of the fact that he was impressed with himself or with these big names. He's just telling stories about his life and these people happen to be part of it. I've got about five more here, but we'll skip them. Most of, most of you know how special a man he is, so let me close with uh, the words of the famous British philosopher and author A.C. Grayling. He had a, some comments on a life well lived. A.C. Grayling said, Socrates famously said that the unconsidered life is not worth living. What he meant by that is that a life without forethought or principle is a life so vulnerable to chance, so dependent on the choices and actions of others that it really has little value to the person living it. He further meant that a life well lived is one which has goals, integrity, and which is chosen and directed by the one who lived it. A life with goals, integrity, and which is chosen and directed by the one who lived it. We're all blessed to have known Red, to have spent time with him, to have been a part of his life. A life filled with accomplished goals. A life lived with integrity. 
a life lived with the love of family and friends, truly a life well lived. I just want to say thank you to those of you that shared today. I know it's never easy to do this on a day like today, but your words uh, on behalf of Red's life just meant so much to all of us to hear those. You know, the older I get, the more I know this, that there's nothing more valuable in this life than relationships. Long-term relationships that bring so much into our lives, I like to call that history. History is not something that comes overnight, but it comes over a lot of days and a lot of nights, sometimes some good, sometimes some bad, and everything in between. But they're the kind of relationships that you've heard about today that stand the test of time. Red had a lot of history with a lot of people. There's so many of you here today who loved him, and I'm sure that there are stories that each of you could tell of how his life impacted yours in some way. That's why we're here today to celebrate and honor Red's life. When I think back on the past few months, I can vividly recall my journey intersecting with Red's. There was nothing coincidental about our meeting. It was very clear that there was a divine purpose in us becoming friends. Red was a gentle and a dear man. From the moment I met him, I could sense that there was a blessing ahead for me. I met Red at church out in this lobby one Sunday morning he was there with Alicia and Garrett by his side wearing a bright red sweater. It was hard to miss. He was warm and friendly. And he immediately made me feel like I'd known him more than just those few moments. The next time I actually physically saw Red, we were getting in his backyard pool to do something that he was determined to do because it was something that was important to him. He wanted to be baptized. As we entered the water, Red was a little shaky, but he was ready. It was such a special moment for him. And when he came out from the water, you could see what he was feeling. We all went and changed our clothes and sat down to visit. And when Red came into the room, like Tom said, he said to all of us as he walked in, now I'm Christians like you guys. <laughs> we confirmed that he was already a Christian. We laughed and we celebrated the wonderful moment of Red knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was ready to meet his Lord. That night was amazing as I too was enthralled listening to Red tell stories of his life. I was on the edge of my seat as he told story after story of how even as a child, he knew that God had been with him and had ordered his steps. As the night wound down, Red in his gentle, sweet way looked across the room at Alicia and he said, We've had a good life, haven't we, Mama? What an amazing thing for anyone to be able to truly say at that moment in your life when things were in limbo. There were some things that Red loved in this life, and many of those have been mentioned today, and what we have heard, we can see that Red lived a great adventure while on this earth. He loved his family. You've heard it said over and over again what a tremendous love story that Red, Alicia, and Garrett shared. Such a rare story of love. Alicia has said to me so many times that in Red's world, she walked on water. What an amazing thing for a wife to know. Earlier when I read Psalm 23, that's a description of a shepherd as one going before the sheep looking for danger, being sure that the path is straight and, and easy to climb. He prepares a table in the presence of our enemies. The shepherd goes ahead to salt the grass for the sheep and ready the land where they'll go. Red was the shepherd of his family, always going before them to prepare the way. Even now he's gone before them to a place where he will be waiting for them. He cared for them, he protected them, and always made sure if there was anything he could do to make their life better as a husband or a pop, he would do it. Such an amazing story of a journey well lived. And even though Red lived this journey here well, he also had a very real eternal perspective that what he did in this life would count in the next. Red's faith and his confidence were in God. He knew where he was going when this day came.